This presentation was developed to support the Control and Sensing Systems Unit of the Combined Electronics Framework at Bournemouth University. In the unit, Kalman filters arise in applications such as GPS localization and data fusion for robot navigation. This presentation is planned to be the first in a sequence of short videos to support the unit studies in robotics. It's intended to give an overview of the territory and is not meant to be in any way rigorous. This first clip provides some background to the two strands of attack to building complex human-type behaviours in robots, the conventional approach as epitomised by the common filter and artificial intelligence methods. The second clip provides a thumbnail overview of how the common filter itself works. It's quite a sophisticated algorithm that embodies a number of concepts we need to check out before diving into the innards of the filter itself these include noisy or stochastic processes, state-space models of dynamic systems, state observers, real-time discrete form algorithms, and least squares optimization. Then, after a look at the basic algorithm, we can go on to take a brief look at extensions to the standard linear filter for robot applications, including the form used in recent DARPA challenge vehicles, that is, the unscented Kalman filter. The viewpoint adopted in this unit is of robotics as an engineering synthesis approach to the imitation of life. And I'd firstly like to try and put this into some context before going on to look at the Kalman filter itself. Life is complex and resistant to the reduction and analysis methods of classical science, essentially taking apart and isolating the thing you're interested in and cutting it up to see how it works. Synthesis, on the other hand, involves trying to practically engineer and construct something which looks or behaves in the way life does. Repli A2 here is a slightly scary imitation of a Japanese newsreader, shown with her creator, Hiroshi Ishiguru, the one on the right in the small picture. She, or it perhaps, made news for working in an information booth at the World Expo 2005 fair, with 77% of her visitors thinking her human a kind of real-life appearance type of Turing test. Replié, however, needs a human operator to speak her words, which is not in the rules of the Turing test. We want our robots to be autonomous, to behave in lifelike and hopefully useful ways without an operator. This isn't easy. It's possible to get computers to do tasks that humans find challenging, such as medical diagnosis, playing chess, composing music, finding the route out of Birmingham and so on. The really tricky bit is the everyday and the common sense stuff like finding the car keys and discussing the match. Computers and humans are essentially good at different things. Most computers are built around processors with relatively serial architectures running fetch instruction, execute and instruction cycles. Machines like Deep Blue here, which beat world champion chess player Garry Kasparov, tend to take a brute force approach by running down many possible combinations of play. Computers are great at things like this, at high-speed logic and maths. Life has evolved in a noisy, complex, concurrent, everything going on at once, and confusing environment. To survive, we often use intuition rather than reasoned argument to quickly arrive at solutions to very pressing problems. Computers, however, are developments of the Western scientific tradition, with their roots in maths and logic going back to the ancient Greeks, and the platonic forms of pure ideal abstractions. It sends something of a mystery why the scientific approach has served so well. A distinct possibility is that creation has an underlying mathematical symmetry and perfection even if it's hard for us to see it directly. And we owe then much to the genius of people like Newton and Einstein, who had the ability to see such perfection beneath the surface confusion. The mass approach has indeed brought us a great deal of practical long-term benefit, in addition to computers, communications and entertainment, cars and rockets, machines, mass production and so on. But there's a problem in stretching the sums to cover the noisy and concurrent practicalities of real-world behaviour. Sums which are hard with assumptions of perfection rapidly become next to impossible to solve with assumptions of reality. The closer we get to modelling real-world, intuitive human-type behaviours, the harder the sums get. 
Artificial intelligence, or AI, approaches the problem from another point of view. It attempts to mimic some feature of natural real-world intelligence, such as brain structures, linguistic programming, or evolution. These are therefore inherently non-linear, concurrent, and noisy from their very origins. They also work, although their inner depths may be much trickier to fathom than conventional methods. We have lots of tools for looking inside regular computer models to find out what's going on, but it's not so easy to investigate, say, a complex interconnected neural network. Take the example of walking. Bipedal walking isn't easy. Humans are pre-equipped to do it, but it still takes a year or two to get the knack. A conventional approach to walking is to form an idealized mathematical model, or suite of models, to cover the stages of gait such as that shown in the slide, and then to use the model to develop an appropriate control strategy. However, an alternative AI approach is to use snippets of initially random computer code and then to model the evolutionary process by breeding from the most successful at walking over many iterations, with the odd mutation thrown in. A suitable fitness to survive decision could be based on the height and distance moved to the center of mass. It may take thousands or even millions of iterations and sore robot knees, but this genetic programming method works, even though the programmer may well not know in detail exactly how it works. How to proceed then? Given the difficult problem, and the imitation of life is about as difficult as it gets, it seems sensible to use any ammunition we can find. Such an eclectic approach involves taking the best from all useful sources and the Kalman filter is an example of the best of conventional mass-based approaches. It's an extremely useful and well-developed algorithm involving the maths of least squares estimation and Gaussian noise process models. As in the DARPA vehicles, it can be integrated with AI techniques to achieve the best of both their worlds to offer us the possibility of vehicles which can drive us safely and reliably even out of Birmingham. But first we need to know how far the conventional approaches can take us. This brings us back to the Kalman filter. A characteristic of life essential for survival is the ability to hold internalized dynamic models of objects in our environment. If you're following the path of a plane in a cloudy sky, perhaps you know someone on board or you're interested in planes, you mainly use direct visual observation of its progress. However, if the aircraft flies into a cloud, you no longer have direct observation and most likely you'll use what you know about its direction and speed before it flew in. In other words, you will use your own internal model of the plane motion, its dynamics, to predict where it is over the next few seconds it's obscured. If the plane's a jumbo jet airliner on a steady course, not an aerobatic stunt plane, and the cloud isn't too big, you should be able to estimate where it is well enough to spot it emerging from the cloud, at which point you'll go back to direct observation. This merging of a dynamic model and observations is a key feature of the operation of the Kalman filter, which we'll pick up on in the next short video.